Brooklyn, a graduate of a degree in computer science from the University of Washington. He is now a full-time volunteer and a part-time professional poker player. Please welcome Kevin Ross. Hi. So, uh, can you hear me if I don't use the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most people tell me I get loud. First of all, wow, I'm really impressed all of you came out here on a, on a Saturday evening. I think that's really cool. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background just so you know who I am. Uh, I was, uh, I'm a local guy and I, uh, I went to Juanita High School and I graduated in 1981. And then I spent seven years trying to figure out what it is I wanted to do for a living. Uh, I was a theater major. Okay, hold on for this. I was a theater major for five years, and I was 10 credits short of graduating, and I decided that um, while I like theater, I probably wouldn't make a living at it, so I switched to computer science, <laughs> which is a, kind of a big jump, but uh, hey, it worked out, because then I worked at Microsoft from 1988 to 96, um, and I was, able to, uh, I was able to graduate, or to, yeah, graduate once again, and do something else that I was very passionate about. Um, what I'm doing now is trying to solve a problem that I found when I was at Microsoft. We, uh, last two years at Microsoft, I was supposed to hire 10 people to fill a, a very specific role on the project I was working on. But we needed 10 people with sort of intense <coughs> computer science skills, intense they needed to have the it factor when it comes to being able to work on our project because it was a very complicated project. I did uh, about 450 interviews, I read 4,000 resumes, and I hired three people. And, but then one of my guys left, so I really only ended up plus two. What was missing? Why? What happened? Somewhere in the, in the early 90s, we realized that students for some reason stopped tinkering with stuff, stopped doing things on their own. I think, you know, when I was growing up, you had, when the TV broke, you actually like pulled the vacuum tubes out, went down to the store and tested them, you had to fix stuff. When the lawnmower broke, somebody had to fix it. When the car broke, you could actually open the hood and fix it. Somewhere in the mid 80s, so I played General Motors for the whole thing. Sometime in the mid 80s, the cars all got computers and it started getting hard to work on them. And your television set became all monolithic and, and it was easier to just throw it away. So students, I, we started to notice students who were missing that ability to tinker and do things on their own. And so a lot of the students came out, were really good at the book smarts, but didn't really have anything extra. They, they, we knew what they were going to know because computer science degrees, for example, are fairly uniform. We know what they were going to know. But a lot of them didn't have anything else on the resume that was of interest to us. So I got involved with this thing called First Robotics. Um, and you, you may have seen some of the robots out there. The goal of that program is to make sure that students have the ability to tinker with stuff and to learn by doing and to play. And it turns out um, it really works well. And here's the cool thing about the, these First Robotics teams is that uh, students become involved in science and technology and they get to play around with things and find out what they're passionate about. Because the thing that I can now that I now realize what it was, the thing that was missing about all of those college graduates is they lacked a sense of passion and or they lacked a sense of the ability to express that passion to us during their interviews. And nothing on the resume explained that passion. So our first robotic students learn, first and foremost, to find the thing that they're passionate about. Most of them are very surprised that, to hear me say, I don't care what they choose to major in. I am just as excited about somebody who decided to go into business or into the arts as I am to find out that they wanted to be a computer science or, a, or an engineer. Why is that? If I've got every student, every one of our uh, 15,000 students a year to become uh, engineers, I have done something wrong. The reason is, is that statistically, not 100% of those people should be engineers or want to be engineers. 
So we encourage, and I'm going to do the same thing with you guys. I encourage you to find stuff that you're interested in doing to find your career and don't become an engineer because we told you to. Does that make sense so far? Good? You know, this, uh, the, the talk today was, it was about innovation. And, you know, innovation is sort of an interesting thing. It has, innovation also has to do with change, right? It's, it, it, innovation is, is when somebody figures out a way to change something that is, that is, uh, that is new and unique. And there's actually two kinds of innovation if you think about it. There's incremental innovation, where you take something that exists and you improve on it and you make it better. The other kind of innovation is called paradigm shifting innovations. And that's where you come up with something that's completely unique, something that hasn't existed before, um, and, and really shape something new in the world. Now, most of us, most of the world, we spend our time in incremental innovation. Most major corporations, for example, my, my company, Microsoft, we were really innovative at first, and now we've been doing incremental innovation ever since. IBM, awesome innovations early on in the, in the, in the, in the, in like in the 50s and 60s, and now they're, they're doing really important and hardcore work doing incremental innovations, right? So that's where most of us live. But what about the paradigm shifting stuff? Uh, let's pick a few things. Uh, uh, Facebook. Facebook is what, seven, eight years old? Right? It was, it was a, a completely new way of hooking up and communicating with people. And it exhibits a lot of the hallmarks that you see in paradigm shifting innovation. It's global. It changed the way people do certain things. Um, it's useful. It is something that, uh, on, the, on the face of it, you kind of go, oh, yeah, well, that's really cool. You know, I can type with people and I can do this like thing. But if you think about it, uh, at least for me, my Facebook community now has people that I haven't talked to in 30 years. I am actually not inclined to actually talk to any of them very often, but it's really interesting that I'm out now able to connect with friends I haven't seen in so long. Or, or to keep up with my immediate family to see what they're doing. Completely new way of thinking about stuff. Uh, okay, so well, all right, so there's there's one, but it seems like a recent thing, right? So in, in 1916, 1916, there was a guy in Seattle who had a delivery service. He rode a bicycle around town and would take packages from one place to the other. And he started to do real well. People, people were hiring him to do this. <coughs> and so he found a couple other guys. His, his company, by the way, was called American Packing Service, right down in, in downtown Seattle. And he realized he couldn't do this by himself. So he found a couple other guys who wanted to do the same thing. They were independent for about a year. And then uh, they decided to form a, a, a bigger co company. And they decided to call it United Parcel Service, right? That United Parcel Service, UPS, was founded in Seattle in 1917 by a 17-year-old kid. In the 30s, or the, the, well, actually it was in the teens, um, there, was a, there was a guy in Seattle who worked for Pacific Lumber Products, who was, uh, in, in his father, he worked with his father. His father was importing lumber from Alaska. And uh, this guy um, started, um, dreaming about uh, better ways of doing things in Alaska. So he built this float plane in a red barn in, down in, in Seattle, right? Built Boeing. It later became the Boeing Company. They, they changed the name not until the 30s, right? So it was Pacific, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the company. But again, it was another young guy who followed his passion and decided that, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we could get, you know, a, a commercial air flight sort of thing going, right? Uh, in the 70s, two kids from from uh, from Lakeside High School thought it would be really cool to put a computer on every desk and in every home. And so that's how Microsoft started. All of these guys are like 20 or less. 
that's you, that's you guys, right? Well, guys like me, we don't innovate anymore. We, 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 got, we got too much crud in our brains. But it's, it's the young people who have, have no experience. They don't have enough experience to realize that they shouldn't do something. Though that is where innovation comes from. And it, and it isn't just the tech industry or whatever, but you know, I, I focus, I know a lot about the tech industry, but you know, you look at you look at Google was the same thing. Google was founded by a couple of 21-year-olds in a college dorm. Howard Schultz was on his way back from uh, from Minnesota. He was going to college in Minnesota when he started Starbucks. Uh, 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 Jeff Bezos, same way, Amazon. Michael Dell was working out of his college dorm room. Uh, Gateway Computer, another college dorm room, right? So these are young people who change the way we buy and sell things, right? Dell Computer, you could actually go buy a computer online. That was revolutionary when it happened. It was, who, who would think of buying a computer mail order online or over the phone? That was silly. But gosh darn it, he did it, right? So, and they changed the way that you and I access technology. So, uh, so innovation is is actually the world of the students, um, like those of you in Wasa, right? This innovation is your world. The paradigm shifting stuff. Uh, if I people with gray hair don't do innovate, don't do paradigm shifts very often. Very rarely. Paradigm shifts happen by you guys. So, um, and the key is they they follow their passion, right? Bill Gates and Paul Allen love to play with computers. They just follow their passion. Do they have any idea that we're going to build the, one of the biggest corporations in the world? No. But they had a vision, and they said, well, let's just go do it. Michael Dell, same thing. Uh, the guy who started United Parcel Service, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, he had no idea it was going to become the biggest shipping company in the world. Now think about what happens um, when you start to form a community around that. And you start to team up. Yesterday, um, no, I'm sorry, on Thursday, I ordered on Amazon.com something that I needed yesterday. So that Amazon order came overnight. I used Microsoft's operating system to order off of Amazon.com, which was shipped via UPS on a Boeing jet and it got from Florida to Seattle in less than 24 hours, right? So what's the, what's the message there? Hey, if, you, if you're involved in a community of people who can do things in an innovative way and somehow collaborate with each other, uh, by the way, Microsoft, UPS, Amazon, and Boeing don't actually collaborate directly. They're all sort of customers of each other, right? Uh, and sometimes competitors. But if you think about it, wouldn't it be cool if, if, if they had sort of very early said, oh, why don't, why don't we sort of work out some things? Uh, because I know you're doing cool stuff, and we're doing cool stuff. We can form a little partnership here, and, and we can make some really cool things happen, right? Does that make sense? So getting yourself involved in an organization like WASA or Washington First Robotics or, or uh, the Science Technology Students Association, you know, these are all actually good things for you to be thinking about doing because that establishes a network of people that, you know, you can team up with and you can partner with and you can learn from. Um, right now, my Washington First Robotics is working on, on uh, putting on really big high school competitions or big, really big competitions in high schools, and we need our own uh, video systems, and, and, and there's a bunch of things that we ended up needing to build, and so we're relying on our network of, of, of other in interested individuals to find people to help us develop the software, and to help manage all the media, and, and to do a whole bunch of things. It's, it, it isn't, we didn't hire anybody for it, we're just relying on our network of volunteers and interested and so we have that, that cool network. And I think that's something that WASA can do for you guys. Is, you know, you, uh, it, it's, it's, it's never too early to get to know people um, because other people have resources that you don't, you have things to offer them that they don't have. Okay. How am I doing so far? So I, 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 my computer died. Otherwise, I put up a slide I brought for you. Because, uh, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that um, that I was going to try and show you was 
um, you know, the, the power of getting involved with a like with a group of like-minded people is 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 so critical to the way that it's very critical in not doing because that establishes a network of people that you know you can team up with and you can partner with and you can learn from. Um, right now, my Washington First Robotics is working on on uh, putting on really big high school competitions or big, really big competitions in high schools, and we need our own. Uh, video systems and, and, and there's a bunch of things that we ended up needing to build and so we're relying on our network of, of, of other in interested individuals to find people to help us develop the software and to help manage all the media and, and to do a whole bunch of things. It's, it, it isn't, we didn't hire anybody for it, we're just relying on, on our network of volunteers of interested people and so we have that, that cool network and I think that's something that WASA can do for you guys is you know you, uh, it, it's 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 never too early to get to know people um, because other people have resources that you don't. You have things to offer them that they don't have. Okay, how am I doing so far? Okay. So I, I, I my computer died. Otherwise, I'm going to slide it out for you because uh, uh, you know one of one of the things that um, that I was going to try and show you was. Um, you know the, the power of getting involved with a uh, with a group of like-minded people is 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 so critical to the way that it's very critical to the way that you will develop in the future is to be hanging out with the right folks. And I, I, I as I get older, I realize just how powerful this is, right? Um, you know, if you want to, if you ever want to be successful, or if you ever want to be really good at something, the best way to do that is to hang out with other people who are better at it than you are. Um, I, I, it turns out I do this myself. All of my best friends are way smarter than me, and I do that on purpose. Um, I, I hang out with some people who just, I, I always feel kind of sheepish sometimes at how smart they are. But I learn from them voraciously, and I learn a lot from them. And that's something that, that you know, that's something that maybe you guys should think about is, um, you know, if you want to emulate somebody, if you want to be part of a community and get to know people, um, that will help you at, as you mature and as you grow into things. So if you want to be a computer scientist, for example, uh, I think it's a great idea to hang out with people who are like computer science. And it's not really rocket science, but a lot of people sort of miss this opportunity to sort of get involved in a, in a group. We find this in Washington First Robotics. We have 15,000 students this year, um, spread across uh, Washington and Oregon, um, and spread across the entire age range. And the nice thing is that um, we've managed to form this very large community of people who are very supportive of every student, of every volunteer, and of every mentor. And it, it, it just really helps to be in a, in, a, in, a, in a society and in a group where um, you can find somebody uh, randomly in, in the world, and you immediately have a connection to them. Um, uh, somebody mentioned I play poker, right, at the beginning. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, so I, I met a poker tournament in Las Vegas. Let's just say I go home early without any money in my pocket, because I didn't win. But I'm sitting in the airport in Las Vegas, my plane was delayed. And I was working on my laptop, and I had a first shirt on. And a guy comes up to me and sits down, or well, it says hello and stuff. He sits down. He turned out he's from California, and the reason he chose to sit down next to me is because he saw the first logo on my shirt. And he was an electrical engineer coming back from a convention, and uh, so we sat and chatted for a little while. He's a mentor on a team in in, in Southern California. And while we were sitting there, a young man about uh, 22 years old saw my shirt, came over, sat down and struck up a conversation and it turns out that he had just graduated and gone to this convention and was looking for a job and the guy who was sitting there had come to the convention trying to hire somebody and didn't find anybody and um, I don't know whether they actually got the job or the connection but they, they uh, definitely had an interview set up so I think that's, you know, that's the sort of power of, of being involved with an association that, that, that lends you, I mean you get that sort of identity thing going on there. Does that make sense?
so uh, now I got I got a couple questions for the students. Uh, anybody know what the highest paid? Uh, the college degree that comes out with the highest paid right out of colleges. Petroleum engineer. Was that it? Petroleum engineer. Yep. <laughs> Did you go to my you were were you you go to you don't go to the internet like do you? I do. You do? <laughs> oh okay, okay, yeah. So so you guys are there, okay. Okay. So um, I, I, I um, so these guys are ringers because I gave a little bit of this talk before. Uh, so petroleum engineers make about one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. That's their starting salary. Um, what about the lowest paid degree right out of college? Anybody? He already knows. He just keeps his mouth shut. Or do you remember? Counseling psychology. <laughs> Counseling psychology. Well, psychology seems like a pretty decent sciencey thing. Um, why is that? Why on earth would they make twenty nine thousand dollars a year on average, right? And uh, I'm going to see if my computer rebooted. Oh, it did. Yeah. Um, so why on earth would uh, petroleum engineers make so much money and psychologists make so little. Supply and demand? That sounds pretty reasonable. You guys, you get that why that would be? There's a tangible resource. A tangible resource. We need more gas. Yeah. Gas keeps going up. We need more yeah. gas. That's and more more gas. gas. And then, uh, so what if I told you I'll give you some more data, see if we can narrow it in on an answer here. This, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, slide show. Look at that. See, I knew I had slides. Okay, so I apologize, the screen isn't very big. Uh, up there, that, that's petroleum engineering. They're making 120 grand a year, that's their starting salary. And then, um, yeah, we won't be able to, I'm going to read these to you, and you can tell me if you hear any patterns. Uh, there's two charts here, the highest and the lowest. There's a bunch of majors in between, right? So these are not the only majors in the world. The majors for highest earnings, petroleum engineering, pharmacy sciences, mathematics, computer science, aerospace engineering, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, naval engineering, mechanical engineering, metallurgical engineering, and mining and mineral engineering. Was there a pattern? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the engineering guys are doing pretty good. So this is 80,000 a year, by the way. 80,000 is starting salary, 120. So here comes the, the bottom ones. Um, here comes, the, oh, health medical preparatory programs. I looked it up. I don't know what that is, So, but they don't make very much either. Visual and performing arts, communication counseling, or communication... Um, uh, disorders, uh, speech pathologists, basically. Studio arts, drama and theater arts, that was my original major. Um, <laughs> social work, human services and community organizations, theological and religious, uh, early childhood education, and counseling psychology. Wow. They're, these guys, that, that's only 29,000 a year. Um, so somebody said supply and demand. Petroleum engineers last year, they graduated 15,000 in the United States. Counseling psychology, they graduated 1.4 million people got that degree. Uh, which is, which I, I feel bad about because my, I, and, and I did a little more research and I, I can, I, while nobody will give a definitive answer, I'm willing to, uh, based on my experience, Make a leap of faith for you. Um, of the 1.4 million people who got counseling psychology degrees, I'm going to guess you that 1.3 million of them chose it because it was the easiest degree they could find in the course catalog. Because when you look at it, guess which one has probably the least math requirements? Yeah. Guess which ones have the most math requirements? Right? Okay? And, and really, honestly, I think that is, that is actually a pretty accurate 
diagnosis, and um, I, I have not done academic research to back that up, but I'll bet you I'm pretty close. Which is kind of a shame because 1.3 million people are now working at Starbucks, oh. right? And it's, uh, that, that I do know, if you go and, and they, somebody did a poll of Starbucks employees who have college degrees who are looking for work, a vast number of them have psychology, performing arts, and history, and, uh, and uh, majors that end in the word studies. Students, please call me. You can find my number. If you are planning on taking a major that ends in the word studies, you and I need to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so, and of course, there's, there's my original major, and this is the one I ended up with, which was way better. Uh, so, why am I, so why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out because there is a very interesting um, trend happening, I think. And it, it's directly related to what WASA is doing. It turns out that there's a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, let's call it, support groups down here for, for the folks in these majors. There are a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of theater groups and a lot of community theater, and they do a really good job at generating community. And they do a really good job at, 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 at having community-based events and reaching out to others. You know, in the past, all of us up here have been sort of introverted. Um, we all sort of, when I got out of college, the fact that I had to work with other people seemed like a real nuisance. But it turned out that it was critical to my role at Microsoft. The first thing I did when I got my job at Microsoft is I went out, I had to write a 438 page book. That was the spec for what I was writing, right? So I think um, we didn't really have like societies. I mean, there, was, there were a few, and there's a few really academic ones. But I think what really needs to happen that, that is missing out of all of the things that you, there's, there's, there's ASME, and there's ACSME, and there's, I mean, there's all these acronym things. And they all release journals, and they all sound very stuffy. They give you journals that have abstracts. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, I don't like to read abstracts of, of other people's things. But I mean, it's very informative and very dry. These people down here, they tend to have fun stuff. They have a good time. They have more of a sense of community, more of a sense of social bonding. And so that's one of the things that we've learned in our first community is that it's okay to be smart and nerdy and sciencey and still have a good time and be a teenager or a, a completely immature adult like such as myself and run around and get funny things and get do fun things, right? And so uh, I encourage you to, to think about that as you're, as you're sort of trying to figure out where you are in the world. Find an organization that is there to help work with you and support you and, and a community you can get involved with and for God's sakes have fun at it because uh, uh, um, they, I, I think it's, it, it's the next step in the evolution of, of all the science people because we need to have a lot more fun than we normally do. Does that make sense so far? Okay, there's more guys with gray beards. Not a yes because he knows what I'm talking about. We've got to have fun in our twins. Uh, so, how do I do? Any questions? Okay. Can you tell them a little passionate about all of this? Um, okay, so um, I think these guys are doing an amazing job at, at something that um, that something that normal science and technology students don't do such a good job at, and I think there's somebody something to emulate. These guys are up here doing presentations, and they're speaking in front of a large group, and they're taking the initiative to uh, to put forth their ideas and put forth their their development of a community, and I think that that. Um, you guys should be applauded for that. I think that's an amazing thing, and I congratulate you for that. And I think that um, it, it's something that's really important and really needed in this. So, um, well done with that. Um, with that, I think I will sit down and listen to somebody else. <laughs> Thank you.
Mr. Osdell.